I tell us fast. Hi. <laughs> Normally, how this works, Alicia, in a studio is the one guest walks away. You have sort of a short break, and the other guest pops <laughs> in. <laughs> and I've got time to drink my glass of water, um, maybe stretch a little bit or something. We should do that a bit. So, stretch. Ah. I'm ready for the next one. Well, I'm glad she's here because I'm dying to hear her session. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah. Uh oh, no I, pressure. I'm wanting no, to no, know no. how close that we are to to getting those um those puppies for Christmas. So I know you're talking about human interactions, but <laughs> you know this is going to make my mechanical puppy more more interactive with my seven year old. Sorry, the puppy I have now snores. So, okay. So I, I I would like a non-snoring mechanical puppy play. We'll see what we can do on that. By Christmas, yeah. we'll see what we can do. <laughs> you, you should know, Elizabeth, that we have a global AI puppy since tonight. <laughs> um, in our pre-show, so we'd start a little bit early to test out our sound settings and video, etc. And we had a, a short chat. And Alicia has a small dog, and I adopted it somehow. It's a global AI dog. <laughs> But I'm not sure. Did I adopt a mechanical puppy or the real one? What what will it be? He's, he's, so my training algorithms are awesome, and he is just extremely well trained. So. Okay, then then I don't mind. Either one is fine. <laughs> so, Elizabeth, you're you're actually uh, working for a Cisco collaboration uh, as the head of innovation. That sounds like an interesting job. Not for all of Cisco, for just specifically collaboration in our CTO team, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you collaborate all day on innovation, <laughs> or how does this actually work? Can you, can you tell us a little bit what your day looks like, actually, as an innovation uh, person? Uh, sure. I actually need to try to share some slides here, too. And this is giving me a little bit of an issue. So I'm going to see if I can bring this up while I'm talking. Sure. I'm a picture person, so let me know if that comes up and you guys can see that. Yes, it's visible on screen. You can see the okay, perfect. So yeah, what what I do on a, on a day to day basis changes pretty much, but I, I head up our uh, part of our team that's focused on disruptive innovation for Cisco collaboration. So we tend to look at things that are several years down the pike that could become products. So we get to do a lot of tinkering, a lot of playing, a lot of exploring, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but we're also dealing with technology that we likely won't see in our hands and in common usage anytime in the very immediate future. So we definitely have to have the long time frame in mind. Um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit today is basically taking us probably another 10,000 levels up from the last presentation, which is awesome, by the way, and looking a little bit more at what is the often overlooked side of technology, which is the people that are actually going to use it. I, I know this is a fault of myself and my team. We often get very excited about what the technology can do, the capabilities of the technology, which is great and amazing, but we can very easily get bogged down into this is so cool we should do this and, and not stop to think should we actually do this do people want this will people use this does it make their life better so that's primarily what i want to talk about today and then relate that back to uh, human and ai interaction but start by talking about human interaction what makes us uniquely human and i swear i didn't know you guys were going to be talking about trees earlier but i do have a slide with trees in here uh, but i wanted to start with why people do the things that we do. So bear with me a little bit. I told you we're going to go several lay layers up here. But if you've ever walked down a tree-lined street in the middle of summer and just heard that hum of lawn mowers and smelled the fresh cut grass and found yourself instantly transported back to summers as a kid, feeling the sun on your face, the warm breeze in your hair, you know and understand how pow powerful certain sights, smells, senses can evoke these vivid, vivid memories. That's part of what we as people, uh, that's what we do. This is how we interact. So when it comes to things like the smell of cookies, baking at the holiday time, if you've ever gone through hours and hours of painful, painful travel, going through airports and horrendous traffic and even worse weather, just to get home, to feel, hear your family argue at the holidays, to smell those familiar smells, you understand how important it is to get that sense and feeling of home, that sense and feeling of community. This is partially what we do. This is how we understand what it is to be human. These things are not necessarily logical nor programmable. 
So when we're talking about what it is to be uniquely human, we do we as a species do things that only humans do. We do things that are things that are emotional, things that are irrational, things that are oftentimes illogical. And it is what makes us unique. We have traditions. We have things that many of them that don't make any sense. We repeat them every year. We do crazy things when our sports teams are playing. We do them just because it makes us happy. And we also, the flip side of it, we avoid things because we have these completely irrational fears. And anytime we try to apply that to computers and technology and AI, it's very hard to program that humanity into it. So that's what I want to get into a little bit. We also, as a society, we do some things that are decidedly unpredictable um, as individuals, but can be very predictable in a group when we do things in a group. I like this quote from uh, the French poet journalist uh, Anatole France. He, he said, human nature is to think wisely and act in an absurd fashion. Today, I want to talk about basically what makes us human what drives our interactions, and how we can bring those human-to-human -human relational tenets into what we expect of our technology, how we think our technology will be used and adopted. I also want to talk a little bit about my personal predictions and theories on what I think technology adoption behavioral shifts we can expect in the next five to 10 years. These take them with a grain of salt. These are my predictions. Feel free to argue them. And what we think breakthroughs in the technology itself, computer vision, machine learning, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, what we think that might translate to. But first, I'm going to spend more of the time talking about humans as a species and who we are and why we do the things we do. We are relational. We are social creatures. So much of what we do evolves around groups. We do things together. We go to the movies together. We watch sporting events together. We attend music concerts together. We like to sweat together in fitness classes. We'll go out of our way to sit shoulder and shoulder to watch a the theatrical performance, to watch a symphony. We'll spend more money, more time, more time in traffic and lines and uncomfortable seats just to do things together as a group. And this is something in the current world situation, many people are missing this element of it because we like being together with other people. We like that social element. We work in groups, live in groups, play in groups. It's who we are. There's also, uh, as a group, we can be very unpredictable and we can change our minds collectively. I have to bring up floor, open floor plans. This is always something that hits a nerve with people. They either love them or hate them. But if you think about as a society, as a group, as a global society, you, you don't have to go that many years far back to think when all the companies were moving to these open floor plans and the internet was flooded with these, who's moving to open floor plans, why they're great, what we love about them, how you work better in them, why to do it now, how you're gonna save money. And then it's only a short period of time after that, we collectively as a society changed our mind and we basically said, open floor plans are bad. They don't work. This is why it's failed. This is why you should ditch it, even though you just invested in it. This is how we're going to fix them going forward. We as a society are very changeable. And if we believe the Albert Einstein quote here, that intelligence is the ability, measure of intelligence is the ability to change, then and humans are truly superior, albeit quite fickle in that regard. So when this comes to human interaction, we're very complex in the way that we interact. Again, this is why it is so challenging to make realistic AI. We have social cues and norms that are just phenomenally interrelated and, and, and very complex. There was a, um, a, a, um, a MacArthur Genius Grant by the name of Amos Tversky. Him and his colleague, uh, Daniel Kahneman, who was, he won the Nobel Peace uh, Prize Award in economics. There were two psychologists back in the 70s, and they went through this experiment to actually prove, scientifically prove, that humans as a species are not rational creatures, and we syst systematically make decisions that really defy logic, but that that is actually a good thing. Because we don't make these decisions solely by weighing facts, it's not just a factual based decision, we often add in all these other things that are very illogical and irrational, but the outcome, we actually often make better decisions because of it. So they were really focused on the fact of the, the relationships. People are fairly, are not that complicated themselves, but when you start getting the relationships between people and the dynamics, it gets phenomenally more complicated and it was very hard to pinpoint that, but it creates these really rich and multi-level decisions that really are the fabric of our society. 
One example I want to use about this is, is expression. So this is actually pictures of my eldest daughter. And aside from just wanting to put big pictures of my cute kid in here and have blackmail photos for when she's later older, she was a very, very expressive baby, of more so than my other kids, quite frankly. It is very easy to tell just by looking at some of these pictures exactly what she is thinking, what she is feeling and experiencing. When people are babies, they don't have a filter. You haven't yet learned how to have that poker face, how to have that filter. So if you've ever given a young child a food they dislike, for instance, they are not hesitant to show you through a variety of nonverbal reactions exactly their opinion and how much they dislike that. This is something that over time, we learn this concept of a poker face. We learn to not wear our heart on our sleeve. But there are still micro expressions that are constantly going on in day-to-day -day communications. These reveal our underlying emotions. And even though we learn more to control those, fortunately in most work settings and meetings, we can hide some of our inner thoughts. Uh, but it's part of that complex web of nonverbal communications. Facial expressions are huge and that's just one piece of it. Things like body movements, posture, proximity, eye contact, tone. This is all part of that complex web of nonverbal communications. And there's arguments been made that nonverbal is actually far more important than verbal. There was a professor, uh, Albert Morabian, who is a psychology professor at the University of California in LA. He did this study to explore how important verbal versus nonverbal communications are. And he had this very well-cited study. You guys probably heard of it. It was in, in the early 19, uh, late 1960s. And he basically concluded that body language accounts for 55% of personal communication the tone of your voice, purely the tone, accounts for another 38%. And when it gets to actually what you are saying, the words you use, that's only 7%. It gives you just a glimpse at how important all those nonverbal cues in human interaction really, really are. This also clues us into why first impressions are so important. There was another uh, very interesting study done by two psychologists at Princeton, uh, Janine Willis and Alexander Todorov. They did this series of experiments that revealed that it only takes a tenth of a second to form an impression of a stranger from their face. So this really gives you an idea about how important those snap judgments are. And what was interesting is they did these studies for longer and realized that even after you were exposed to somebody for a longer period of time, those impressions usually didn't drastically change you would get more confidence in your initial judgment, but oftentimes that first impression was what uh, stood with you. This is also some of the science behind why it matters so much when we are making that first indirect introduction with someone, that first um, presentation. It also explains the entire concept of speed dating, which is basically these short timed interactions between people. Usually it's only three minutes, sometimes longer. And it's based on the logic that it takes people such a short time to make up their mind about someone. There was another study that was done in Ohio, uh, Ohio State University, where scientists found that people can usually tell in the first one to two minutes whether they're interested in a relationship with another person. And they continued that study to see that after nine weeks, that initial impression made in the first one to two minutes hardly ever changed. So you realize how, how strong that is. The whole book, Blink, by Malcolm Gladwell, I'm sure you've come across this as well. This focuses on the power of thinking without thinking. It's all about intuition and instinct. And his phraseology is thin slicing, but it's basically the same concept of how we use limited information for a very small period of time and draw a conclusion. And these can actually be quite accurate. Now, again, apply this to human interactions overall and what is so important to us because we're so relational and because our relationships are so complex and they're driven by so many things like nonverbal and intangible qualities, a big underlying driver of this is trust. This is why people stay in long-term committed relationships. This is why people work with the same people for a long period of time and pull known quantities onto a new team when they're starting a new venture. It's this idea, can you trust another person? Is that person considered trustworthy? And trust is repeatedly cited time and time again as the number one quality that's valued in a relationship, That's whether it's romantic, social, business relationship. It's also credibility has been cited as the, one of the top qualities in a leader that makes make a, a leader a desirable leader. We put so much value on trust. I like the, this uh, little visual here too. 
one of the things that brings us all back to cookies that I had in the beginning. I must be hungry when I made this presentation. Raising cookies that look like chocolate chip cookies are the main reason I have trust issues. The fact that trust is so detrimental to the longevity of our relationships, the depth of our relationships, it's such a deep subject that we will often make light of it by adding some levity to the gravity of this quality of trust by memes and things like this. The concept of breaking trust is also something that's been around since basically forever, uh, since the dawn of time. It's been referenced in art and literature. The concept of breaking bread has roots in biblical references, where it basically became synonymous with the mean a meaningful connection made over a meal. It was the meaningful connection with another person. It basically meant the sense of familial familiarity with someone or a group of someone's, and it allowed you to build rapport, establish trust, and that was crucial to really founding relationships. So if we now take all this and apply this to technology, what does this mean? This was so far all been about human to human interaction. So when we start talking about human to technology interaction, we tend as people to want to apply humanizing capabilities to our technology. We tend to humanize it in a couple different ways. Before I get into this, let me first explain a little bit about who I am and what I do. So I mentioned before, I'm Director of Innovation for the Cisco Collaboration Group. Our charter for our team is focused on disruptive innovation. We are tasked with building a bridge between the state of enterprise collaboration today and the experiences that we think will be possible as technology advances in the future. So we explore, discover, experiment with, play with, tinker with, at times invent new technologies that ultimately shape the future of work. I work in technology. I'm in a future gazing branch of technology. I work for the office of the CTO. I'm inside of an engineering technology group at a high tech company headquartered in the heart of Silicon Valley. It would be very easy to call myself a technologist. However, when people ask me what I do, I try to be very clear that I'm not in the technology business. I am in the people business. If I'm truly doing my job and my team is truly doing our job, the solutions that we build should fade into the background. And what comes out is a more powerful way for humans to connect and transcend these traditional barriers of time and space. That's what we're trying to do. So even though I work for a technology company, I am in the people business. So when we talk about humanizing technology, what do I mean by that? I look at humanizing technology as two different facets. Firstly, we try to use technology as a way to unlock relationships. It's important to understand that when you introduce technology to a human-to-human -human interaction, it doesn't replace the human interaction. It doesn't downplay the importance of it either. If anything, it should facilitate it. Basically, we humanize this technology in, in it by way of unlocking this connection that otherwise wouldn't be possible, thinking of it as using technology as a bridge to get to another person. A great example of this is the history of the very first telephone call. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell conducted the first telephone call ever recorded. His first words were, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. It's very interesting to me that the first usage of what ended up being a revolutionary technology ended up basically being a way to speed up and facilitate face-to-face -face interaction. So even the early switchboards were an interesting reminder of the, the connectivity by, brought about by it because they would basically literally plug cables into appropriate ports to connect to people on opposite ends of a call. The second part of what I mean by humanizing technology is ascribing human tendencies to the technology itself. So beyond just using technology to facilitate access to humans, uh, we are in some ways attempt to make our technology feel more human in a way that we want to interact with it. So what I mean by this is a couple of things. So one being the whole concept of personification. Personification, the attribute of personal nature of human characteristics, applying it to something that's non-human. This is why kids paint smiley faces on rocks. This is why the logo on the side of all your Amazon boxes looks like a smile. This is why we put these cute robot faces on robots that work in warehouses and retail environments to give them these googly eyes and cute names. We are personifying our technology. The other piece of this is a little bit more complicated and it goes back to the concept of trust. So the idea of breaking bread that we brought up earlier, why credibility is 
such a desired trait in our leadership. The importance of trust is so strong, strongly ingrained in us as humans that we apply this to our technology as well. We use the same ver verbiage and description when we describe technology. I had a, a coworker recently mention that she was in a conversation with a potential customer and they, mainly because of the current situation in the world, they were using technology that they had never used before. And when they were describing what they wanted or what they needed, their main concern was around security. But what the customer wanted in their technology was end-to-end -end encryption in that particular solution. But the customer didn't say, I want end-to-end -end encryption. What the customer said was, I want a tool I can trust. Because we take those terms that we are familiar with and those concepts that we are familiar with and we apply it to our technology. We apply this human vernacular to our technology exchanges. So how do we put this all together? Uh, so insights from humans in the past can help us predict how humans will adapt into technology in the future. How do we really realistically expect this to change over the next five, 10 years? This is where I'm gonna get into a few of my predictions. Take this with a grain of salt. So firstly, I think we are changing where we work. This is not so much future state, this is current state. This is the world we live in right now. For better or worse, the current situation, we have collectively as a global society experienced remote working on a grand scale and found that in some areas, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> in other areas, it works great. And it really depends on how and it's applied and the area that it's applied in. But I, I take my, my group uh, personally, I, I've worked remotely for the last few years. This is something that uh, many folks on my team work remotely. We're a global team across, I think, nine different time zones, nine hours of time zones, four different countries. Uh, it's, it's a very spread team. So we're very used to working remotely. And there are certain things that we know to do, have a dedicated home office space, try to keep certain certain hours that are work hours versus home hours. Simple things like get out of your sweatpants, get on video. It, it makes it easier to do remote collaboration. But the biggest lament of remote workers is usually this, this feeling of lack of connection. I don't feel connected to my coworkers the way I used to. And it's interesting to see how people are changing their meetings and their approach now, again, as we're doing this on a grand scale. We and my team, we've had started doing these um, regular no agenda water cooler type calls that's usually involves wine, coffee, sometimes both, depending on what time zone people are in. And we're on video 100% of the time. We don't do audio calls. Uh, we do crazy themes like Hawaiian shirt day and crazy hat day and favorite sports team day and a, a way to kind of get everyone doing the same thing while remote. And that has really helped bring some camaraderie to it. But we're realizing this is just different. This changing where we work, people talk about the new normal all the time. D regardless of how work looks at your workplace a year from now, it will be different from what it is today and it will be different from what it was a year ago. So we are absolutely changing where we work. One facet of this is security. I, I mentioned the customer before that said trust is so important. This concept of end-to-end -end and security. As you're starting to see people working from all over these different places from different connections, you're not going to see a lessening of security requirements. You're going to see an increase in this. And it really comes from our need to want to trust our machines. But it gets very complicated when you start looking at people joining from different devices, different locations, different types of networks, spotty Wi-Fi, all, all these types of things. So security gets really, really interesting as an area. We could probably do a whole segue on that, but I'll uh, leave that for now. <laughs> And also, we're changing how we work. Uh, we'll start looking at things beyond how do people connect in a more technologically advanced way, but how do we use technology to make that interaction even better than what you could do purely in real life? Things in augmented and virtual reality, we've talked about some today, have made major strides in the last few years, but how do you go from a step further of just like, hey, on a video call and waving, to actually feel as if you're being there together? I have a short video in here that I don't know if it's going to work. I'm going <laughs> to try it. If it doesn't work, let me know. I can talk through it instead. But we'll, We can we'll certainly try. We've got Hank in the background, and he's great with this uh, sort of thing. So uh, just give it a shot and see what happens. Oh, there's no sound. sound? I, I don't think we. All right. 
Um, I did send the video. If you guys have it on your end, maybe we can play it after. But yeah, uh, in in the interest of time, I'll basically just move forward to say that. What we could try actually is uh, if you stop sharing your screen and share it again, but enable sound. There there should be a check uh, checkbox saying I want to share sound. That that might actually fix the problem that we have. Let's give it a whirl. See what happens. It's computer technology. So basically, this is turning it off and on again, but different. It's kind of like kicking it, right? <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> if in doubt. All right, it's not giving me an option. Oh, it's not working. Okay, let's do. Let's move on. Then. We'll make sure right. that we share the video afterwards. That uh, that works too. Uh, no worries. Um, are you guys seeing my slide share again? Yes. Yeah, okay. that's working. Perfect. So I'll give the, the very short, it's a short video that is just a teaser of a product that my team is building right now. Um, I should clarify, prototype that my team is building right now, not product, we don't build product. Uh, but it's, it is in the AR VR space and it's really focused on that concept of how do you be there with another colleague. Uh, this is an early concept drawing, it gives you a, basically an idea of what it is, but I won't go into too much more depth. So moving beyond how we work together, we're changing with whom we work. And this, I think, is an interesting concept too. Uh, it, it's going to the whole definition of what my team does. We are a collaboration group. Historically, collaboration has meant the act of working with someone to produce or create something. And that concept is really evolving over time. It, it, we're no longer thinking of how do I work with someone, but how do I work with something, a machine, a, a bot, a device. And that's a very different way to look at collaboration. We're no, looking, no longer looking at it as, as this purely human-to-human -human collaboration, but human-to-machine, human-to-AI, human-to-technology interaction. And how do you fit that all together in a way that doesn't feel clunky? And that's a big thing that we need to solve. <laughs> but it's very interesting and very exciting as well. With that, some of my predictions of what I think evolution of AI communications will look like. We still may be quite a ways off from having artificial intelligence with this high emotional intelligence, strong perception. However, I think as we progressed already from very simplistic models, things like chatbots, to more sophisticated models that can encompass natural language processing and are conversational, my prediction is that we'll begin to layer on contextual awareness to that, and eventually we will get to some element of social awareness and some concept of social intelligence. We'll see this evolution beyond this conversational AI to layering in all this contextual awareness and basic social cues, and that does get us a step further to ultimately getting achieving this element of social intelligence. I also think we're going to see a greater depth of social dynamics in our software, so not just these binary conversations, but the ability to drift in and out of conversations online the same way as you could in person. As we build out this complexity of the virtual interactions, this will start to become possible, and I'm hoping we can talk about this some in the chat after because this is a really interesting area, I think. <laughs> So as far as the future of collaboration, I'm going to wrap up here. It's a very exciting field to be working in. There's so much opportunity on the horizon. Within my team, we're asking questions like, what if I could have real life interactions that are better than what's currently possible in real life? What if conferencing doesn't have to be limited to this two-dimensional plane? What happens when real and virtual are no longer distinct ideas and they start blending together? What happens when artificial intelligence begins to have this concept of emotional and social intelligence. What are those communications and interactions like? And that is really, really, really exciting to me. So just to wrap up my thoughts here, humans are unique. We value meaning, trust, experience. Technology is built for humans. And as much as we can remember that, keep it to the forefront of everything we build. We use technology to expedite or enhance these human connections. It's an extension of our humanity. And technology will be successfully adopted, I think, when it adheres to those values, when it expedites our connection, when it enhances our relationship, that's when you ultimately see adoption. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I've definitely enjoyed sharing it. Feel free to reach out to me and that's all I have for today. Cool. Well, thank you very much. It's an interesting talk seeing uh, this per perspective in the field of AI where we we spend an awful lot of time talking about neural networks and, and amazing technological advances in that field. Uh, it's good to remember that AI is actually here to enhance humans rather than replace them. Um, I find that 
personally really important, but it's good to see that more and more companies like Cisco are uh, working on this actually. And uh, we actually have got a, a question from um, somebody in the audience uh, in regards to that. So let me find that real quick. Um, so, so I, I do have to say while you're looking for that, that if, if I can find an empathetic enough chat bot, I will be calling into that customer service line every day. And right. So they can empathize <laughs> with me about my day and about my sorrow, <laughs> about my finances or whatever is going on or my lack of trees. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Bose is asking, when using technology, we currently use a lot of screens, as you mentioned. When talking about video conferencing, we're using our screen to see each other. We're using a webcam to connect. Um, do you see a, a large role for screens and cameras in the future, or do you think that we're moving back away from that um, when we talk about collaborative sof software? My personal opinion on this is there will still be a large role for cameras and screens, but the same way we're redefining what collaboration is, we're going to redefine what a screen is. Does a screen mean a piece of glass? It may. It may just mean a piece of glass that's changed size and changed location and has more flexibility, or a screen may be I put on my AR goggles and there's my screen. It, it may be projection. It may be something projected onto my retina. It, there, there are a lot of options of how you can describe a screen. Cameras are more interesting because the whole ability to capture, we haven't figured out any way to do that without cameras and a lot of cameras. And how do you make that not be obtrusive? And that's actually the little teaser thing I was trying to show there. That's something that my team has been working on is how do you enable these two-way interactions that are live and in real time and not make it feel like you have a wall of cameras in front of you. And that's something we think we've solved, but that's, it's, that's very challenging. Uh, so I do. I don't think they're going away, but I think we're going to redefine what they mean. Yeah, exactly. And and in um, adding to that, I saw another question from someone in the audience mentioning that uh, now that we can use AI in computer vision and AI in voice generation, actually, um, we can actually enhance what we see. We can. We've seen the, all the negative samples uh, with deep fakes, with uh, 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 the president saying something else. Uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, are we going to see more stuff in the future that actually uses AI uh, to enhance the interaction that we have as humans? Most likely. We're already seeing that in our meetings today. We have things, I mean, do our own product plug. We have WebEx Assist, which is something that we've added to our WebEx meetings. It's basically an AI running in the back of your meetings that's helping you take notes, follow up meeting, that kind of a thing. So I think you see a lot of that in the background, you'll see. Um, and, and you're starting to see that, I think, in all of our tools. You're also seeing you know, Snapchat filters and things like that. How do I enhance the way I look, How, the, the visual there? of, And that's because yeah. more and more people are on video. That has become very important as well. Uh, I, I think that's going to be very different for the different use cases. But we, we use augmented reality as a buzzword all the time here. But if you really think about what does augmented reality mean, then it's reality that you have augmented. You have improved it in some way by overlaying something on top of it. And I think we are absolutely seeing that today in a lot of ways. And I think the future will will definitely see more of that. Yeah, sort of the advanced um, <clears throat> Snapchat filters where we can <laughs> say, well, I'd like to make my face a little bit more sun tanned um, just to give the illusion that I had a great vacation. Uh, those sort of things I think we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing soon in the future. Um, given that we've seen so many chap Snapchat filters with mustaches and, and dog's ears and those kind of things. Those are funny, but uh, I I personally feel that we'll soon see a generation of um, video filters that are capable of, capable of doing much more than that, actually. Yeah, I think beyond just things that are aesthetically pleasing, the things that will be useful in an interaction, like it would be great to have 
Well, and we're talking, I'm going to go back to our conversation we had on Monday and I have this little field I can see in my view of like, oh yeah, we chatted about this and you mentioned this about your kids and like a reminder of our last conversation. It's enhancing our current interaction by being, replacing my poor memory <laughs> with, with uh, AI memory that remembers much better than I do. That type of interaction, you see how that can be phenomenally useful in meetings and enterprises and medical settings and uh, a host of, of different industries and verticals. Yeah. That sounds really interesting. There, there's loads more questions coming in. Um, so uh, Boaz has another question, which is also interesting. So we've talked about computer vision in this case, how we use AI to enhance basically our meetings. Um, how about haptic sensors? Maybe if we combine that with computer vision, that, that should yeah. be fun. So we've played around some with haptics personally, and the Technology hasn't advanced quite as quickly in the haptic space as I would like to see. And I think a lot less over the last year because COVID-19 didn't do haptics any favor. Uh, it's something that if the technology was already there, this would be a great time to use it. But when, when you're at a point in the technology where you need more people hands-on testing it, it's really hard to do that in the current environment. So I feel like haptics is almost stalled a bit in that regard. Uh, but that's absolutely something I think we're going to see in the future is adding in the other the other senses. Right now, so much is focused on audio and video. That's how do we make those better? How do we augment those? How do we you know improve those? But we have other senses. <laughs> we have multiple senses. How do we layer in all those other things? And there are some really great haptics companies out there that really focus on think of yourself in a physical world without the ability to touch how would you function? Like, if it's so important in your physical, why isn't that just as important in your virtual interactions? And that's a pretty logical argument. So I think adding haptics in the future will definitely be something with Steam, but I think it's going to be a lot longer on the time horizon just because of where we're at with the technology. Yeah. So that, that yeah. Um, so there's your answer, Boaz. <laughs> uh, it's a long way from home, but I mean, who knows what could happen next year once we get out of the uh, pandemic and, and people start thinking of new ways of interacting again. Um, or, I mean, uh, we're in the pandemic. I've seen some developments around spatial analysis, for example, which is also a computer vision application where uh, the pandemic basically forced us to think about new ways of applying AI in this field. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so talking about the social aspects of of those micro interactions. Um, <clears throat> how does that work out currently in computer vision, in your opinion? So I'm going to have an overly biased opinion here because of the technology that we're building. Uh, we're building something that is in the it, focus on photorealistic holograms. So I believe that that is the future. Um, that is why I don't think avatar adoption will be huge overall in the long term because you lose those things. Having this sort of blanket, yes, I'm seeing my car cartoonish version of me raise its eyebrows. Like, that helps to get gross expression uh, across, but so much of human interaction is around these very fine-tuned micro expressions. And you simply can't do that if you don't have photorealistic quality in real time that you're seeing how another person is reacting. So that's my personal opinion on that one. I guess it's it's a, it's a huge challenge to get that working with uh, uh, neural networks. I've got some experience myself and I know that it takes an awful long time to train a neural network to even recognize the eyebrows on a person, let alone those micro interactions of slightly raising your eyebrow when you're not agreeing with something. Yeah. Um, it, what does the challenge look like for you? Five years. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> like story. a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking of the project we've been working on. We've been working on it for five years to get to a point where it's like, all right, we're getting there. <laughs> um, and it's not even ready yet. It, you're getting yeah. there, so there's, yeah. there's still a ways to go. What, what do you think? Do we get this sort of stuff in five years, ten years? What, what sort of the prediction? Here? I think you'll start seeing some pretty awesome stuff in the next two years, quite frankly. Uh, oh. But if you want to see everyone goes to this, I want minority report. I want I want these kind of crazy interactions. Like we're not quite at that point where you're gonna have these huge grandiose scales and you don't need anything other than little chip or, or contact lens you put in your eye. Like that's still gonna be a ways away. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what advancements we see in uh, eyewear 
uh, right now, I mean, if you want to get to these mixed reality type scenarios, it's basically HoloLens or Magic Leap or basically the, the two out there that can do these really complex interactions. If you, but they're both, it's a heavy thing. It's, um, you know, you're wearing something. So uh, until we get to something closer to what you're wearing, a set of eyeglasses that feels very lightweight and it's not intrusive, I think uh, there's a lot of limitations of what people are going to be willing to put up with. So I think you'll start seeing, you can see, see stuff in the very short term, I think, in enterprise settings in certain verticals where, hey, I can put on a headset for a short period of time. But if you want to see mass adoption, it's going to depend a lot on the form factor. Yeah, I mean, and that one's pretty large still. Uh, Stefano talked about this earlier in the episode where he mentioned that the battery life of a HoloLens is pretty short and its weight is 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 huge compared to normal glasses that uh, Alicia is wearing currently, but I'm wearing my glasses normally. I don't put them on on stream because that's horrible to look at. I've got those blue filters in there that's uh, strange to look at. Um, so Alicia, would you actually wear such such a pair of glasses if, if it would have a small camera inside and, and allows you to communicate to people? So, you know, I've, I've been thinking about it and they have the face masks, which which are a little bigger, right? So if you could get one of those just a little bit heavier, um, be, because people use those all over the place and you can see expression through the screen and it's so protective, right? And um, people are okay with that. So I, I think if they could get it down to that size and it looks like we're, ha we're seeing the hardware improvements, right? And hardware improvements really drive a lot of these efficiencies sometimes, which enable us to, to do these calculations at a quicker pace. So um, it sounds like maybe there's an opportunity for collaboration, right? So <laughs> <laughs> definitely, get some of these AI chips, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess the biggest challenge that we have currently with uh, computer vision applications is that the smaller we make this form factor to put the models in and the, and the other software that we need, the more power constraint we become and the more compute power constraint we become. So it's more of a matter of balancing the affordance of the technology we're using versus the power that it offers us. So if, if it's a heavier device, we get more compute power, but it's also harder to use. So that so finding the sweet spot, I personally, I don't think we will ever wear a uh, a lens in our eye that basically projects images on our uh, eye whenever it wants to, because sometimes you just got to get away from computers. <laughs> and that's even the case for me as a as a total deep learning geek. Uh, <laughs> that's important to still do. Uh, it can be very overbearing, all this technology. Um, you so. don't look forward to being plugged into the matrix. <laughs> no, no. So, so going I, back I have to many friends who who did not change any of their habits once COVID and quarantine started. So <laughs> any work from home friends. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're lucky as IT people uh, that we get the we do already a lot of stuff from home and remote. So we're we're sort of used to uh, this extra cognitive load. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm just grateful that you know humanity still reaches out for for interpersonal interaction. You know, like I see people in my in my community taking walks and you know having conversations with each other six feet away, and I I I think you know regardless of the the technology, um, I don't think we're going to get to a point where we're stuck in our homes um, plugged in all the time because I, I think we we're still always going to need um that physical touch right sorry i'm a hugger i need my hugs i need to interact with people and hit my hug quota <laughs> yeah i guess that that's one of the challenges that we have with te technology i guess so um one of the worries that i have is when you use a computer it's it's a decidedly different um form of interaction so it it, it places a, a cognitive load on you um is there any work that you know of elizabeth that that people are working on to reduce cognitive load of using tools like uh, cisco webex uh, maybe other conferencing tools 
Yeah, there's a lot of uh, all of the technology companies are have right now have ML and AI groups that are looking at can we make this less painful? <laughs> That's maybe not the best word, but yeah, as people are using things long longer and longer, uh, there's definitely a lot of teams that are looking at that. I don't know of any amazing breakthroughs that have happened in that in that space. Uh, I do know there's lots and lots of of work and exploration, but. I would say that's not nearly as far along as some of the stuff we've been talking about in computer vision. Yeah, I'm just looking at the at the questions from the audience. There's there's a bunch more stuff going in. Um, so one of the other things that I'm wondering about: how do we make sure that this technology is inclusive? For example, for people who can't see, we're talking about computer vision, so it's visual, and then I can't see. What happens next? Yeah, uh, that's why uh, I think adding the other senses is going to be really important. Uh, there's been a lot, a lot more focus recently in some of the things I've seen, just in the last few months, actually, uh, where we're adding in alternate cues of, I, okay, I'm doing something. Say I'm, I'm wearing a headset, an AR headset or a VR headset, and I I want to. Uh, might have limited ability. Maybe I'm, maybe the individual is colorblind, or maybe there's some some sort of um, physical impairment there that they might not be able to see the full depth of certain things. Uh, the other thing that's been interesting in realizing what percentage of the population actually cannot see 3D uh, using a stereoscopic headset. Uh, it's a double digit percentage. So that, that's a large factor as well. Uh, but there's been a lot, I, I've seen, like I said, just in the last few months of adding in, well, maybe I add an audio cue when, when someone is doing this, or maybe I add in some sort of haptic feedback, depending on what kind of a rigor setup you have, so that it might supplement the visual. It's still very visual heavy. Uh, I have seen a few cases where they've had some sort of virtual meeting, and, and the focus was primarily on audio, and then visual, visual was like an add-on. So I gave you the ability to see as well, but it was really focused on the audio and all the dimensionality of that, of having the music and the cues and the and prompts. And I think you're seeing more of that, but you see the same technology curve for everything. First, it's figuring out how do we make, is this technologically feasible? <laughs> can, we, can we make something that does this? And then once we do that, it's like, how do we make it better, faster, cheaper? smaller and, and and then in that process of better faster cheaper smaller it's also how do i widen the usage for it and i think a lot of this technology it's still early in that curve so you're only seeing that inclusiveness in certain areas as they're sort of cusping that you know cresting that that curve there so it's i wouldn't say it's even across the board but there's definitely been a much bigger focus on it probably since March, <laughs> because more and more people are using it. You know, as you can notice the timeline relates very closely to what's going on in the world uh, because those issues have been raised. So the the acceleration of adding in that uh, alternate usage and inclusivity, I think is happening much more rapidly than it would normally, which is maybe a silver lining to the current world situation. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen that this uh, across the board for for AI. Actually, last week we had a discussion with uh, Richard Campbell. Um, he's he's a famous guy. He records a lot of podcasts uh, on the internet. Um, he's well known in the Microsoft community as well. Um, uh, he he actually showed us the the history of AI last week, and we had this discussion where we saw that in the 80s we had compute problems. We couldn't possibly train a neural network that was too slow, but nowadays we can easily train a neural network where Heck, we're, we're training neural networks with one and a half billion parameters. That's like, uh, I can't do that on my machine. Uh, it doesn't fit. Um, what we've seen is that just now we're starting to learn that AI is actually something that's pretty dangerous. And we should spend more time thinking about, yes, we can do that. But why are we doing this? Is this the, the best option we can offer to a user? Is it inclusive? Is it fair to everybody? Um, is this something that Cisco is aware of, and, and are you spending a lot of time on that? I would say there is a group of people that is spending a lot of time on that. Uh, it's a little bit, at least for us, it's a little bit of there is a group of people focused on those particular issues and problems rather than it necessarily being ingrained in everything. I think at some point you will see that uh, translate more broadly and people will be factoring that in from the get-go. But again, I think it's just where we are in the curve. Uh, it's more now, it's figuring out how do we do that? 
And then once we figure out the how, then we have the systems in place that we can roll that out more broadly. But we're still working on the how. <laughs> well, it sounds really interesting because I, um, um, I'm speaking to a lot of companies about AI. And I don't know about you, Alicia, but um, I haven't heard a lot of talk about model fairness or making computer vision solutions compatible for people who can't see. Um, uh, how is that in your work? Sorry, who is that question directed at? Uh, sorry, Alicia. <laughs> well, I, I think, um, you know, I, I echo the sentiment that a lot of people are still talking about, you know, how. And it's it's really the people who are um, the architects that ask why, you know. And, and you know, when you start looking at um, GDPR and where Jada where data gets placed and data restrictions and the different privacy concerns. And I think a lot of the um, the rules and the governing restrictions of, of the different countries drives a lot of these conversations. But um, they're, it, they're just so relevant that when you're building these systems, you, you really need to start asking those questions up front nowadays, you know? And, and um, just with the court cases that came out this year, um, it's quite impactful to deploy a commercial solution that isn't kind of in the public's best interest and people find out about it and there there aren't as many rules out there that there should be but I, I think that we're seeing that the response time is very very quick to, to rectify that so I, I think that um, you know, the more we start using these systems, the more these situations come up and uh, the more opportunities we have to have those discussions and to make that change. So uh, definitely at, at the builder level and um, but but I think everybody starts at the code and, you know, gets excited and think about all the things I can do with this. And then af after that, it's um, but should I be doing it right Cool, cool. So um, the, the 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 whole ethical aspect. Um, there's not a lot of legislation, as you mentioned, uh, Alicia. And um, so, Elizabeth, what do you think of uh, initiatives around bringing in legislation around the use of AI? Well, I think we learned from Terminator. We don't want to wait until after we build Skynet to then decide, should we build Skynet? So <laughs> I, I think it's something that you do. It, it's a unique area because I think it's something you do need to look at the legislation in the process of building it. Uh, and a lot of times legislation is an after, not, not necessarily an afterthought, but something you do after the fact. You, you do build the technology first and then you look at how and where and why should we use it. AI is unique in that, and I feel like you are seeing that now in that there are more and more court cases around AI, even though the technology is still quite nascent. And I think it is necessary because of the nature of what is capable with AI that you do need to be building your legislation along with building the technology. Yeah, that's pretty unique for to AI. Would you say that we are right on time with legislation around AI? All right. Do I want to answer that in the grounds I'm making? <laughs> Feel free not to answer that. Or um, I, I'm wondering because I I personally feel that um, so when I teach AI to to young students, they already know that AI is in Spotify, in their Snapchat, in their Instagram, in their Facebook, if they use that at all anymore. Um, it's everywhere, and 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 since it's everywhere, I would actually argue that it might be a little bit on the late side. Uh, we might have to fix some of the damage that we've caused already with all the amazing, cool code that we wrote. I won't argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Let's, let's keep it at that. Then. Yeah, that sounds like an awesome idea. So there's one last question that I would like to ask. Um, so um, someone uh, asked, yesterday I was at a hacking conference, an AI hacking conference. Um, uh, how will you relate AI to hacking in this case. What are you going to do against that, for example? I do anything against it. 
<laughs> yeah. Do you mean on the security side? Uh, well, like when it comes to on the creation side, why would you do anything against it? I mean, the creation is creation. It's great whether it comes from a human or an AI. Like let's let's get as much as we can. Uh, on the security side, I mean, there's. I know our security division is humming like nuts these days. There's so much to be looking at and so much to be exploring. And as you start getting into these really creative things, like how do you detect and block deep fakes? How do you all, there's so many different things that we need to do to ensure that our community, where the communications and collaborations team, how, how do we ensure that our communications and collaborations are effectively reacting to every security threat? Uh, AI is interesting in that it's throwing lots of security threats out there all at once. So from that perspective, I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's something that we need to be focused on. And I know our group is, and I know other major technology companies are as well. Like, if you just read the headlines for the last few months, security, security, security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been pretty important. And, and we've seen actually uh, a lot of samples where hackers uh, uh, attempted to fool a neural network uh, th that was using computer vision by just injecting some noise in there. So that seems pretty interesting um, to actually, on one side, try it out once. I guess you need to do yeah. it once to discover what it's like and what you can do against it. And on the other hand, what are we going to do against that? And do we need to worry at all about those kind of attacks uh, when we, we talk about collaboration or maybe other solutions in that field? Yeah, on the security side, absolutely. And if I were in the product organization, this would prob probably be the number one thing that kept me up at night. But thankfully for my own sanity, I'm not in the product organization. <laughs> I'm a prototype organization. So. Our view of this is much more on the, not how do we make this safe for everyone? How do we protect our, our tools against it? It's much more on the, cool, what could we do here? And, and so it's more of the experimentation. How do we break something? Like, let's try 25 different ways to break it and see what we could do. And let's also like, hey, have you tried, anytime we do something like, have you tried, like we have our resident AI experts, like throw him in there, see what he can do and like, see if we can come up with a different answer. So on the creation experimentation side, I think it's phenomenal because you can find some really interesting things that I think as as humans, we would have a harder time making that mental leap. But then you see, let me interject some AI. Oh, this is way. Oh yeah, that's what AI would do in that scenario. That's not what I would have thought of, but that's pretty cool. And it, it helps you learn much quicker. Yeah, that sounds cool. So. Actually, now that I, I, I come to think of it, your job is actually at the beginning of the curve trying to explore what's possible and the other departments such as legal and security and the product departments are actually working out, is this actually an idea that's safe to bring on the market? Is that we correct? We have to do the really hard jobs. We just have to have all the fun. I hope, I hope my management chain doesn't watch this. Sounds, <laughs> sounds like an awesome job. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> for talking to us. I'm, I'm actually quite happy with uh, uh, with the talk because I never actually spend a lot of time thinking about those micro interactions. I'm, I'm all about the code and worrying about how do I make this neural network work correctly. So Absolutely. that sounds cool. Well, uh, Alicia, do you have anything to add to that? I mean. Uh, no, you're one of my heroes now. So I definitely enjoyed the talk. And thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Yes. And uh, I'll do keep an eye out for my robot dog. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do by Christmas. <laughs> very, very cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Cheers.